is just fantastic. Captain's Log, Subdates 220315.2 I know that some inmates have kinks or vices and interests beyond the conventional being an inmate thing, but some of the more recent additions take the piss, and today's newest addition takes that to the next level. Welcome everyone to the Halls of Injustice. Today we welcome inmates number 119 to the ISO cubes. His name is Mark Redwine, and his crime stretches back nearly a decade at the time of recording, but owing to the nature of how Mark went about this, i.e. both committing the crime and concealing the crime, it took a number of years for not only things to be found that needed to be found, but for the reason for it to be brought to light. Along with the fact that even with national support, Mark Redwine somehow managed to conceal it rather well. Mark Redwine is going to be here for the rest of his natural life, which should be an indicator just to the severity of the crime he committed. But there is a rather peculiar twist with all of this that I alluded to in Captain's Log. And Mark Redwine is not somebody that takes responsibility for his actions. So this should be quite an interesting tale. We will of course start with who Mark Redwine is. We will then go through what the crime was that he committed. The arrest, the trial, and the sentence. The victim of the crime committed by Mark Redwine is his own son, Dylan, and it is with that we now can dive straight into who Mark Redwine is, along with providing additional context about certain living arrangements concerning Mark Redwine and his son. Mark Redwine is a 59-year-old former trucker from Durango, Colorado. He had two sons, Dylan being one, the youngest, and Corey, the oldest, both of whom lived with their mother, Elaine Hatfield Hall, over in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Owing to the relationship not being overly great between Mark and Elaine, a court had to impose mandated visitations for the sons to go spend time with their father, and it is where one of those visitations took place that things go wrong, which would then lead into the crimes of Mark Redwine. While I was doing some digging on Mark Redwine, I did notice they had linked a Facebook page on Google. It's not the same guy. Please don't link that. The wrong person is getting criticism, not that the real Mark Redwine would see it in the first place. Although, to be honest, they're both real Mark Redwines. You've linked the wrong one, Google. So adding any additional information to this segment would be redundant. There isn't much to go on beyond fractured relationship, court-ordered visitations, formerly a trucker. Also got a bit of a reputation for not being responsible, which explains a lot. So now we shall move on to the crimes of Mark Redwine. For this segment, we actually have a timeline. One part is provided via a Facebook page called Dylan Redwine, The Journey to Justice. The other is a timeline from the Durango Herald. We shall use both because some fill in gaps to the other, and of course, vice versa. On the 18th of November, 2012, Dylan Redwine arrives in Durango from Colorado Springs after 6th Judicial District Judge David Dickinson issued a court order granting Mark Redwine visitation rights during the Thanksgiving holiday. Upon arrival, Dylan sends his mother a text message to indicate he has arrived. Accompanying that message is an emote indicating a scowl, which seemed a tad out of character but also could well be an indicator that he doesn't want to be at his father's. After arriving, Dylan and his father go to Walmart. This has been verified through security cameras. According to Mark Redwine, they then went to McDonald's, but that could not be verified. Through text messages, Dylan's rescheduled plans to arrive at his friend's house the next morning to hang out at 6.30 a.m. All electronic messages from Dylan stop at 9.37 p.m. Dylan's father, Mark, had told the person who runs the Journey to Justice Facebook page, so whoever the username is, that he had woken up early in the morning, and he had tried to wake Dylan up, but he didn't want to get up so he went to town without him around 7.30 a.m. On the 19th of November, Dylan's friends text him to try and arrange to meet up. His friend Ryan Nava texted Dylan to ask where he was and to contact him or to contact someone to let him know where he was. 
At 6 p.m. that day, Mark Redwine calls the police to report Dylan as missing. Shortly after, La Plata County Search and Rescue begins searching for Dylan in areas near County Road 500, where his father lives north of the reservoir. Before he had made the phone call, when Mark Redwine returned home at 11.30 a.m., Dylan was not there, nor was his cell phone or his belongings. Mark had taken a nap after returning home from his errands, and that he had thought that Dylan had been out playing by himself or may have walked to a friend's house. The friend lives 5.9 miles from Mark Redwine's home. There were reports from people that they had seen Dylan walking about, but they were all proven to be unsubstantiated. From November 22nd to November 24th, 2012, two search teams of 30 volunteers each canvassed the reservoir and Forest Lake areas, handing out flyers and searching abandoned buildings. This included Ryan Nava, Fernando Stubbs, and Leslie Herring, all friends of Dylan. Two days later, nearly 200 community volunteers and law enforcement personnel, including a helicopter from the San Juan County Sheriff's Office, La Plata County Mountain Patrol, La Plata County Search and Rescue Teams, and two canine search and rescue teams go door to door and search the forest in Valcito and Bayfield. Law enforcement teams with cadaver dogs search the reservoir, and during this, Mark Redwine's home is also searched as well. The problem was the dogs were unable to find a scent that was Dylan's, so tracking him down would have been trickier, since all his possessions were gone. Mark agrees to cooperate with all of this. The family is then subjected to polygraph tests. Mark Redwine's was inconclusive. The family had asked him to retake it. He refused. Dylan's cell phone records were then checked, and his phone activity is monitored at all times, but his phone had been turned off since Sunday night, and GPS was not available on that phone. All sex offenders in the area were also checked and accounted for. The lake and surrounding areas were searched and scoured by hundreds of volunteers to include abandoned buildings, houses, barns, and sheds. Boats with high-tech sonar were brought in, and an entire area in front of the dam was checked. Nothing was found. A task force was formed, and house-to-house -house business to business interviews were being conducted from the dam on the south end of the lake to the north end of the lake. This all then leads to the police declaring Dylan to not be a runaway. A search warrant was issued to search Mark's property to include his house and vehicles. The sheriff's office maintains that Mark is not a suspect. The search of the property by the task force is because that was the last area that Dylan was presumably in, and they have to start somewhere. A few days after the search, Mark Redwine does another interview with media and has rumbled blanket and pillow on the couch. There is also a cereal bowl on the counter that he says Dylan ate out of. Just a heads up though, as stated on the Facebook thing, if it had his DNA on, they would have taken it, Dylan's that is. He also states that the TV was tuned to Nickelodeon, even though Nickelodeon on Monday morning is apparently geared for four-year-olds. Helicopters are seen in the air again on day 15 of the search, boats on the lake again as well, with nothing being found. There are currently 45 to 50 officials made up of the FBI, CBI, La Plata County Sheriff's personnel, and other agencies assigned to the Dylan Redwine Task Force. Over a thousand people turn out for a benefit to raise money towards the Find Dylan Redwine Fund. With that, they're able to increase the reward to $11,000, with funds being made at the benefit dinner. Bloodhounds are then brought in to see if they can pick up any scent of Dylan. Those bloodhounds were then taken to the same areas that have been covered before with no scent being found. The family then flew to LA to appear on the Dr. Phil show and beg the nation to look for their son. Those episodes aired on February 26th and February 27th, 2013. The reward was then elevated even further to $50,450. Seven months after the disappearance of Dylan Redwine, authorities found partial remains miles from Mark Redwine's home. And in 2015, Dylan's mother filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Mark Redwine, but it failed because it had surpassed the two-year statute of limitations. It was also in 2015 that Mark Redwine was identified as police as a person of interest. Two years after the discovery of partial remains, hikers found Dylan Redwine's skull, and it is with that 
that we end up getting closer to the arrest of Mark Redwine. Forensic examination found blunt force trauma to the skull along with a fracture above the boy's left eye, which experts testified likely were inflicted by another human and not an animal. I say that because when partial remains were found, Mark Redwine's belief was that a mountain lion or a bear got him. In July 2017, Mark Redwine was arrested and charged with child abuse and murder. So with that, we now get to the trial. When this went to trial, District Attorney Michael Duggerty told jurors the defendant's words and his deeds had pushed this loving boy to the point where Dylan no longer wanted to have any contact with the defendant. And the only reason he had contact with the defendant was because the court ordered him to do so. Earlier in the trial, prosecutors had revealed a compromising photo of Mark Redwine. In the photo, Mark Redwine is in women's lingerie, while he appears to be consuming feces from a diaper. After Dylan's older brother, Corey Redwine, testified in court that the siblings discovered the photo on their father's computer, the prosecution then argued that this discovery led to a slow decline in the way Dylan saw his father and their closeness with Duggerty saying Dylan was no longer simply an adoring young boy who just wanted to be with his parents. He came to recognize that his parents were people, and he came to recognize the person that the defendant was in his life. I think you might be hard pressed to find anyone that would not look upon their parent in a different light when they saw their own parent consuming poop from a diaper while wearing women's lingerie. Public defender Justice Bogan, huh? pressed the jury to consider any reasonable doubt arising from the prosecution's speculation on the motive, as well as the lack of DNA evidence, weapon, and cause of death. With Bogan being quoted as saying, The government, the prosecutors, the La Plata County Sheriff's Department, FBI, Colorado Bureau of Investigation, National Forest Service cannot tell you after nine years what happened because they don't know. If they don't know, you don't know. The defense argued that expert testimony earlier in the trial showed Dylan's skull was still in perimortem state in 2015, with him saying that means it retained elasticity and wetness, making it susceptible to environmental factors like animal scavenging for three years before it was discovered. Bogan also called the investigation biased and sloppy because of evidence destruction by an expert who broke off a piece of Dylan's skull during the examination and a scientist who revealed in court that the prosecution gave police reports to them before their testimony. Bogan also said investigators were selective with the evidence collected and called Mark Redwine a target because cameras and GPS were set up to watch Redwine. The prosecution emphasized that Dylan's lack of text messages and social media activity on the morning of November 19th, 2012 show Mark Redwine's attempts to cover up the murder with stories contrary to Dylan's usual behavior and plans for the day. Mark had agreed to drive Dylan to his friend's house when he returned home from errands around 11 a.m., despite text messages that show his son planned to go to his friend's house at 6.30 a.m. If Dylan were alive that morning, like this guy wants you to believe, he would have been in touch with his friends, responded to his mother's texts, and shown activity on Facebook. Those are words from the district attorney, continuing by saying, instead, Dylan was never heard from again. The defense said that Mark Redwine was the guy working in the oil field, didn't have enough time or knowledge to dismember a body, clean up effectively to evade a luminol test for blood, and appear fine at work the next day. With the defense arguing that, because the evidence is circumstantial, it is more than likely that Dylan ran away, and that he was then killed by a wild animal. Whereas the prosecution ended by saying that Mark Redwine killed his son during a fit of rage after the child had confronted him about the photos. On July 16th, 2021, nine years after all of this took place, Mark Redwine was found guilty of second degree murder and child abuse. When the verdict was read, the courtroom erupted with Corey Redwine, Dylan's brother, saying, he is where he belongs. He is Dylan's murderer. That's how he will be remembered and how he'll have to live the rest of his life. Dylan's mother, Elaine, said that this entire process had been surreal, from when Dylan went missing to when they found his remains. Living in a world of not knowing what happened to my son, Mark is going to be penalized for what he did to my son. He knows as well as us. He was the one that took Dylan's life. I've cried, 
I've been mad. Right now, I'm just ready to remembering Dylan and his story, rather than the gruesome details of his death. So with this, we now get to the sentence of Mark Redwine. We have to skip ahead a few months, but we get there, as there is a little fallout afterwards as well. Mark Redwine, inmate number 119, aged 59, was found guilty of second-degree murder and child abuse. Sentenced to 48 years in prison on both charges to run concurrently. The prosecution were pushing for a lengthy sentence, and they were pushing for it because of the complete lack of remorse shown by Mark Redwine, identifying him as a cold-blooded killer, something which Judge Jeffrey Wilson agreed upon. At the age now of 60, it is highly unlikely Mark Redwine will ever see the outside of a prison cell unless his body is being removed from it and he is no longer on this mortal coil. During the sentencing, Mark Redwine was not permitted to speak. Judge Wilson, though, said that the 60-year-old had taken no responsibility for his actions and that he could not remember a defendant that had shown less remorse than him, being quoted as saying, The community needs to be protected from you. You need to be removed from society for a very long period of time. I'm going to sentence you to 48 years on both counts, with five years of parole. You will be served concurrently. You will receive 1,540 days of credit for time served. I did take the liberty of looking at whether or not this qualified federal trial or whether it's remained a state trial. As it turns out, there are prerequisites that must be met for it to become a federal trial. This one did not qualify. Under Colorado law, the sentence is life, and that is essentially the sentence he's got, based on what time he has left on this planet, even with the credit applied. Now, I alluded to the fact there is some fallout, and that is that at the end of last year, so in November after being sentenced, he has actually lodged an official appeal. The main premise of it being that the evidence is not enough to prove with beyond reasonable doubt that he did anything that he's been accused of. If there is an update to that in the future, of course, I will provide it. For now, get the feck in your cell and stay there. So as we have reached the end of this story, I'd very much like to know what you all think. I'm going to link a whole bunch of sources down below that may well provide suitable context. If you think I've left anything out, do let me know in the comments. I hope you all have a fantastic day, and thank you all very much for listening.